Welcome to episode 5. First of all, I'd like to put out a big thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this episode. The patrons have spoken. We're getting all of the evil megacorps out of the way early. It's Omni Consumer Products. From the Robocop Film Universe. We've already been dumbfounded by Starship Troopers. Now let's look at Paul Verhoeven's original attempt to confuse the shit out of audiences everywhere, as well as normalize co-ed locker rooms. It's Robocop. A brutal satirical commentary on a range of societal ills which is still disturbingly relevant today. Covering issues such as unchecked corporate power, media bias, gentrification, privatization, and some strange mixed messaging on police militarization. It even predicted the real life bankruptcy of Detroit somehow turned American police unions into the good guys and put forward the questionable idea that without an adequate police force crime skyrockets overnight. I wouldn't buy that for a dollar. Of course, this heavy, blood-soaked extravaganza was deemed adequate fodder to make KFC ads, a WCW crossover, a Nixon media stunt, toys, and several TV shows aimed at children. A campaign as eclectic and questionable as omni-consumer products themselves. Said to provide products for nearly every consumer need, OCP has garnered massive influence over Detroit and its media, branching out into traditionally non-profit areas such as hospitals and prisons. They also partake in other dubious pursuits such as military weaponry and data. So guys, be sure to protect your data from shadowy corporations and the like by using Surfshark VPN. A virtual private network encrypts your data, keeping you anonymous and protecting all of your information, files, and passwords while online. Whether you're using a PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone, a VPN is quite simply the best way to keep yourself secure while on the internet. It will even help protect you from malware and give you peace of mind when using high-risk connections such as public Wi-Fi. Surfshark VPN is also packed with a range of other features, including the ability to bypass internet censorship and geographical restrictions. And yep, it works with Netflix and other streaming services. Just change your virtual location to open up a whole new entertainment library. But perhaps most impressive of all, with just one account you can use Surfshark VPN on an unlimited number of devices. No other VPN service offers this deal. And all of this for an extremely affordable price. So head down to the video description and check it out. Out. Use promo code MEDIAZALOT and for a limited time you'll receive an astonishing 85% off. 3 months extra for free and a 30 day money back guarantee. So click that link, check out the deal and keep your browsing secure with Surfshark. Old Detroit. At the start of Robocop 1, it's already a decaying urban hellhole, filled with heavily armed, trigger happy maniacs. <laughs> the city in financial ruin, which I'm sure the corporation had nothing to do with. They've contracted OCP to fund and operate the Detroit police force. That doesn't sound very profitable. So OCP are messing with the cops, intentionally putting officers at risk and withholding funds. And they've also been secretly protecting the local crooks. Now they set out to murder the problem they helped cause with a range of urban pacification solutions. It's an elegant, if not convoluted, corporate scam designed to increase profits and pave the way for the full privatization of Detroit, rebuilt as a corporatocracy, Delta City. Yes. The trouble is, most of OCP's urban pacification solutions aren't capable of actually pacifying anything, and the one that is, is out to get them. Point 1. OCP creates and maintains a relentless force of justice, which could be their downfall at any moment. Come quietly or there will be trouble. It's our boy, Robocop. 
a badass, ruthless cyborg killer with a strong disdain for bringing in perps alive. Of course, we just can't help but love him. Though that's not surprising, he's inspired by anti-heroes such as Judge Dredd and or Spawn. And the guy is also an allegory for Jesus Christ. Apparently. Okay, okay, I got a kick out of it. Ultimately, Robocop is said to be a successful product, but I'm not sure how exactly he would be profitable. His upkeep must be insanely expensive, and he causes a huge amount of collateral damage. I can only assume the state is paying OCP service fees, but considering they're broke, that can't be much. And although Robocop has some initial success, it won't be long until the crims figure out his weaknesses. The dude can't even run, in fact he spends the majority of his time immobile. But whatever your stance on Robocop as a force for good, one thing is certain, his design and function guarantees he will end up standing against his own creators. For a start, Executive Bob chose to use Officer Alex Murphy's remains to make Robocop. They did try to wipe his memory, but you better hope his personality doesn't reassert itself, because this guy is a white knight with a strong sense of duty. And although his boldness was as undoing as a normal officer, it will be his strength as Robocop. He's the perfect fit in terms of creating a force for justice. But is that truly what the corporation wants out of this? OCP executives are unethical at best, and on occasion they even commit outright crimes. So it's somewhat concerning that Robocop is programmed with prime directives, which will inevitably draw his gaze to OCP. The first directive is so ambiguous, in Robocop's mind the company should be immediately red flagged. The second could also be open to interpretation. And once Robocop gets out there and starts investigating things, it won't be long until the company falls afoul of his third directive. But there is one more directive. A secret one, inserted by Dick, designed to stop Robocop from acting against the corporation. But as we'll see, it doesn't work as intended. A hallmark of everything this company does. Omni consumer products. What a bunch of morons. Point two, a dysfunctional corporation filled with overconfident morons dooms all of their schemes to failure. Their reckless prototype demonstrations amplifies the damage. Before Robocop, the company's big urban pacification solution was ED-209, a murderous mech walker so poorly designed it would probably lose in a fight against an ATST. Despite being a law enforcement unit, ED-209 doesn't appear to have the ability to actually arrest people. He can only issue commands and then murder crims if they fail to comply. And the old man CEO has the audacity to pretend this is somehow giving back. I think it's time we gave something back. And I have the higher obligation to keep you from putting yourself and others at risk. We don't get to see OCP's product team running tests on this thing, assuming there was any. All we know is it ran into a series of delays and cost overruns. So now Senior Vice President Dick, under pressure, has deemed ED-209 ready for a demonstration. And rather than showing it off in a safe facility with the execs protected behind armor, cocksure Dick just whips it out at an executive meeting in a high rise. He's even loaded it with live ammo, and he couldn't just have ID-209 wander around for a bit with an explanation of its abilities. No, he drags up this poor junior exec to play the criminal. If there are any issues with ID-209's logic circuits, he's created a scenario most likely to cause a serious error. And of course, there's no emergency shutdown either. We may need to disable the entire security subroutine. ID-209's programming issues are a failure of design and testing. But Dick and Dr. McNamara's decision to load it up with live ammo and without fail safes is just straight up hubris. At the very least, Dick could have shot off blanks. That hurt. So logically, the company shut down the ID-209 program the moment these issues became glaringly obvious. Dick, I'm very disappointed. Nah jokes, they're keeping this guy around forever. They did feel pretty terrible about the potential financial losses though. Your temporary setback could cost us $50 million in interest payments alone. Bob then capitalizes on this tragedy by drawing the old man's attention to his Robocop project. I'm confident we can go to prototype within 90 days. Good. 
and thus Robocop, the greatest threat to the corporation other than themselves, was born of a pissing contest between two competing executives. It's even said the initial plan was developed simply as a means of lighting a fire under Dick's ass. The old man ordered a backup plan. Probably just to light a fire under Jones's ass. So therefore, the old man CEO, who appears to be naive if not vacant at this stage, can take his share of the blame too. He's encouraging this cutthroat, ultra-competitive environment, which leads to his pressured underlings cutting corners and taking massive risks for the sake of a personal win. It's an instinctive need to establish a dominant position in any social gathering. He also oversees a corporate strategy which focuses mainly on high risk schemes, the success or failure of which will massively affect their meta project, Delta City. Not only that, but he seems to offer no oversight other than the occasional dressing down after the mistakes have already presented themselves. There are no real repercussions for Dick other than a bruised ego. You call this a glitch? This really doesn't seem like a good environment for developing profitable products. It's no wonder it's said this company never finishes anything ahead of schedule. What are you kidding? They never do anything ahead of schedule. So Robocop starts plugging crims left, right and center, causing Bob to create this impossible expectation live on TV. At Security Concepts were projecting the end of crime in old Detroit within 40 days. Dick then makes it obvious that his ego and personal grudge are more important than the wider success of the company by getting angry at Bob over his initial success with Robocop. And you've insulted this company with that bastard creation of yours. Dick even knew about Ed 209's flaws, making his boardroom presentation take on a whole new level of stupidity. I had a guaranteed military sale with Ed 209. Renovation program. Spare parts for 25 years. Who cares if it worked or not? Seems like a pretty short-sighted plan, Dick. Dick. Creating faulty products isn't exactly a winner in the long term. If Ed 209 can't even work on the main streets of Detroit, not sure why the military would be interested in taking it on. We practically are the military. Next, we find out that Bodica actually works for Dick when he turns up at Bob's house looking to murder him. I can't tell who is worse here. Dick for pre-recording a highly incriminating DVD of himself. I guess you're on your knees about now, begging for your life. Or Bodica for leaving witnesses alive and relying on a grenade to do the job, walking away without confirming the kill. If Butterfingers Bob hadn't messed things up, he might have even survived this. Now with a sweet DVD to bring down Dick with. Meanwhile, Murphy has overcome OCP's inadequate attempts to suppress his personality, investigating his own murder. It's Dick Jones! which eventually leads him to Bodica, who rolls on Dick after Robocop roughs him up a bit. <laughs> so with criminal activity linked directly to OCP, Robocop does what he was always destined to do, and shows up at OCP headquarters to root out the crims. Of course, Dick isn't to blame in terms of Robocop's creation. In fact, he actually planned for this outcome. But Dick being Dick, he didn't plan things very well. It's him that gave Robocop his secret Prime Directive 4. Any attempt to arrest a senior officer of OCP uh. results in shutdown. And although it says shutdown, it actually means break down temporarily. It's possible Murphy's personality is able to resist the shutdown somehow, or perhaps Directive 4 caused a logic conflict with the other directives. But whatever the case, this directive on the whole is obviously pretty inadequate. It only stops Robocop when he physically tries to make the arrest. It still let him have the intention and charge all the way down to OCP headquarters before it triggered. There are numerous ways this directive could be circumvented. Now that Robocop knows about it. He could simply investigate and arrest the bit players. And then when it comes to the top execs, hand off the evidence to another white knight. But Directive 4 does get Dick a passing win. Until we discover he's at Ed 209 hanging around in his billiards room for who knows how long. And this is meant to be his trump card. I'm just shocked Dick is still alive. I had to kill Bob Morton because he made a mistake. Now it's time to erase that mistake.
He then spills his guts to Robocop about a murder the officer knew nothing about, seemingly going all in on Ed209's ability to defeat Robocop. Dick knows better than anyone how flawed this robot is. Half us shut down or not, I know who I'd put my money on. And this place is getting totaled. One more Ed209 mishap and the old man could be gunning for Dick. Dick! But that's the least of his worries I guess, because all Robocop needs to do to escape is run for the nearest staircase. That's right, Ed 209 is the Dalek of mech walkers. Quite an accomplishment, considering the whole reason you'd make a mech walker is to capitalize on the bipedal ability to handle variable terrain. This guy can't even get back up if he falls over. Is there a car lift or something around here? Because he definitely didn't take the stairs to get up here. It's the urban pacification unit that can only handle a very limited range of urban environments. You better hope criminals don't learn to run indoors. At this point you might as well just throw the thing on caterpillar tracks, at least it'd be quicker. So Dick then relies on the cops to sass Robocop. And hey, since they're practically owned by OCP, they can can take a bit of stick here too, despite Robocop being one of their most effective officers, taking out several cop killers. A bunch of these pricks open fire on Robocop without a second thought, but then they finally decide to take issue with the corporation and strike against them within days. Dick has somehow covered himself for the incident at OCP HQ, and rather than severing contact with Bodica for ratting on him, he gets him released from custody and invites this known cop killer for a meeting in broad daylight. Employing this psychotic, unpredictable criminal was already a hell of a risk. Now he's counting on no one around here watching the news. Clarence Bodiker, unofficial crime boss of old Detroit, now sought in connection with the deaths of 31 police officers. Despite confessing murder to Robocop just last night, Dick chastises Bodiker for failing to realize Robocop has an inbuilt recording system. He recorded every word you said. His memory is admissible as evidence. I'm not sure if he's projecting or simply passing the buck. But now he's going to count on his unreliable henchman to kill the cyborg, bribing him with the opportunity to ruin the corporation's most important project. But Delta City begins construction in two months. That's two million workers living in trailers. That means drugs, gambling, prostitution. Does Dick actually want OCP to make money? After Robocop finally gets his revenge against Bodica, he's immediately back to OCP HQ, where we find Dick is now putting all employees at risk by turning Ed 209 into a glorified parking warden. You are illegally parked on private property. You have 20 seconds to move your hand. Robocop dispatches it easily before heading up for another bloody awkward executive meeting. Here Robocop exposes Dick in front of everyone. I had to kill Bob Morton because he made a mistake. And we bear witness to this guy's final error. And I'm not talking about the loaded gun he just left in the boardroom. It's another scenario that Dick's directive just didn't account for. Dick, you're fired! His employment termination. This all seems strangely familiar. You're fired. Things don't get much better in Robocop 2, though there is a small initial victory. Attorney General Marcus today approved the ED-209 combat unit for deployment in five American cities, despite widespread complaints of malfunction. Which makes Dick's entire struggle in the first movie kind of pointless. <laughs> The old man is still around, but now he's turned from a distant CEO into a full-blown villain, deteriorating the situation on the street even further by engineering ongoing police strikes. When are you gonna start paying the cops so they'll go back to work? Holding the city to ransom for money owed. In the event of default, OCP shall have the uncontested right of foreclosure on all city assets. And duping the idiot mayor into signing over the foreclosure rights. Why do you have to label people? I hate labels. You shut up. 
an important step on the path towards Delta City. The company remains committed to wiping out any trace of Robocop's humanity, which is the key advantage he has over robots such as ED-209, his ability to act with good judgement and discretion. Though I admit, a more compliant Robocop will be less likely to act against the company. If that's really their concern, just be done with it and pull the plug already. Not content with merely sabotaging their successful product, the company then sets out to make Robocop completely obsolete. It's the Robocop 2 program. But as usual, the development team haven't done their due diligence, and the old man isn't paying attention until he's already sunk a gargantuan amount of money into it. 90 million. These freaks are somehow worse than ED-209. At least this time, most of the important people are viewing it safely. A new employee suggests that Murphy's psychological profile must have been a one-off among the cops. Yet at no point do we see them trying to replicate the original Robocop precisely. Of course, the answer they come up with is to use psychotic murderers and criminals instead of cops. That makes perfect sense. She's screening psychotics, sir, murderers. Well, we aren't planning to build a toy, Johnson. After a tiny piece of action, the bewitched old man supports this idiotic idea. Juliet has also kept Robocop out of commission since a run-in with some kooky crumbs, which in terms of the corporate agenda probably isn't a bad thing. But the old man is acting as if that negates the risk a psychotic Robocop 2 could pose to the company. Yes, sir. With Robocop out of commission, the chaos down there will increase. And so will the odds that the city will fall into our hands. He chastises Johnson for not seeing the bigger picture. You've got to learn to look at the larger picture. Despite the old man agreeing to keep Robocop out of commission, which would have been clean and easy, Juliet instead decides to fix him up and fill him with superfluous directives, rendering him incapable of doing his job, but also getting the attention of everyone in Murphy's crew, including this lady, Robocop's caregiver, a sympathetic doctor in a position that should have been occupied by a corporate hard ass. Can run a few thousand volts through him, pray his insulation holes, probably kill him. She tells Robocop exactly how to get rid of all of his directives, allowing him to get his revenge on criminal cult leader Kane. Juliet decides that this ruthless master criminal with a god complex is the perfect candidate for Robocop 2, revealing herself to be pretty demented as well. This company seems to be absolutely filled with these psychotic, comically incompetent leaders, followed around by a gaggle of talentless sycophants. That's right, OCP are like the insane same clown posse of nefarious corporations. Though she is a bit of a joke, Juliet is probably right that Kane will be compliant because of his nuke addiction. But let's keep in mind this guy knows how to cook up the stuff himself, and I doubt he will forget the horrific treatment he's received. The odds of success are low to none, regardless of the facts. The company has shifted 80% of its cash resources to make this doomed plan a reality. We shifted 80% of our liquid resources to the urban pacification plan. But then the nail in the coffin, someone's fronted up with 37 million, saving the mayor and the city. I'm just surprised that didn't happen sooner, really. In retrospect, that was actually a pretty reckless plan, and everything hinges on it. Getting desperate, the old man is willing to delve into full-blown criminal territory to make the city foreclosure happen. There must be no witnesses. Now they're going to directly murder people, and Juliet sees this as a great first mission for her psycho new Robocop. There is no need to add murder to your list of offenses. Despite failing to kill the mayor, in the grander scheme of things, I guess that counts as a successful test. After blooding their new creation, they've decided they're now ready for a full-blown public showing, with cameras and an auditorium full of important people. I'm sure this will turn out just great. Surely there must have been a less extreme method of testing your assumptions. And they've gone from merely pursuing some authoritarian policies to full-on Nazi signalling. The old man then goes on a bit of a political rant and outs the company's use of nuke like it was nothing. I'm assuming he wasn't properly briefed as usual, because nuke is the very thing that will get this robo-psycho excited. And Juliet has been withholding this shit hard. Why didn't they just have the unit powered down? It doesn't even seem like they were going to show off its features. At least they didn't load the 
this one up with live bullets. Oh no, wait. His armaments just aren't active. The kill switch doesn't work and everything relies on one remote. He's got tons of ammo. It's the most costly PR disaster the company has faced so far. Robo Kane just starts shooting everyone. This could look bad for OCP jumps. Scramble the best fin team we have. Though I will give the corporation credit for one thing. This unit is seriously impressive in terms of combat abilities and durability. Though he's not without weaknesses. It's sophisticated but not without its vulnerabilities. If that jumps straight to military applications, this guy could have been a winner. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> for some reason, Robocop decides he can't be bothered nailing the OCP leadership for any of this. Perhaps we should have kept a few of those directives. But this event does plunge the corporation into financial strife and possibly criminal proceedings. We're looking at major indictments, sir prison terms. The old man takes Johnson's advice and tries to pin it all on Juliet. She did choose the brain, sir. Though he apparently fails because at the start of Robocop 3 we learn he had to take the fall for it. Remember the old man, Jeff. Everyone's expendable. And most damning of all, this formerly all-powerful corporation has now been absorbed by a Japanese rival, Kanemitsu. But there is one silver lining. After all this time, the company is finally going to go through with their biggest project. Maybe. Knock it off, Johnson. Point three, their abuse of Detroit's population and police department guarantees rebellion, condemning their most important project. Delta City. It was only two months away at the end of the first movie, but now the corp is getting all serious about it. They've seemingly given up on the corporate swindling and the bots. The company now employs a military unit to get the job done, forcibly removing the citizens of Cadillac Heights and shipping them off to what sounds like a concentration camp. Oh, there goes our PR budget. So the Cadillac Heights population starts a rebellion movement. Before this point, the residents of old Detroit seemed apathetic to the company, but now things have been taken way too far. The new CEO doesn't seem like the typical variety of OCP asshole. Get the hell out of here, all of you! But he's still sunk 350 million into this horrific relocation project. And if he doesn't clear out Cadillac Heights within four days, their loans will default, leaving the company in ruins. If Cadillac Heights isn't cleared for demolition by Friday midnight, our loans will be called in. OCP will be ruined. Worst of all though, he's put this guy McDaggart in charge of operations, another absolute clown. Ed 209s have gone from parking wardens to security guards, hanging around at armories and the like. Though they end up just being another weapon to steal. OCP have had years to iron the bugs out, yet these latest Ed 209s are easily hacked by a child. Of course, we've got another sympathetic doctor looking after Murphy. She neglects to suppress his humanity as ordered, causing Robocop to start nosing around where he doesn't belong. Robocop's directives have been reinstalled which obviously puts him against the company again. They should have probably made sure he was offline before starting all this. Though they have included a slightly more effective Directive 4, which forbids him from opposing any OCP officer. It still seems vague enough to overcome. So an overconfident McDaggart kills Murphy's bestie in cold blood. He's going to do far more than simply oppose you after that. Dr. Lazarus eventually deletes Robocop's fourth directive like it was no biggie, leaving him free to hunt OCP officers at his leisure. First, he takes the pain to the rehab staging area, but unfortunately, McDaggart has got inside word and hold up elsewhere. Not a secure facility, mind you, in a crusty hotel with a terrible guest privacy policy. Where is McDaggart? Room 212. He even told some of his weak-minded rehab underlings exactly where he'd be. Where's McDaggart? McDaggart and Johnson then turn up to further harass the poor cops, who have been manipulated, underfunded, and threatened by automation this entire time. You got an alien cop? Huh? You got a ghost cop? Leon, I told you I don't have time. You got a vampire cop? 
Finally, they come out from under the corporate boot, resigning in disgust when asked to assist in the relocation project. Up until that point, they were basically turning a blind eye. But the corp has always had this coming. Their Delta City plan had a major miscalculation from the start. A disgruntled, poorly treated police force is never a great way to drag the population into line. They should have been rebranded Delta City's finest and given a fitting salary. Then maybe they could have pulled this thing off. So with nothing left to lose but their chains, the rebels and coppers team up to take it to the corp, leaving Mick Daggett with no choice but to reinforce his men with a bunch of maniacs, the splatterpunks. These guys will just walk straight into gunfire. Luckily the cops are worse shots than they are. The CEO, apparently fine with murdering civilians, now draws the line at killing cops. What, you going war wacky? Not that his opinion matters anymore. He's lost control of this McDaggett lunatic, who seems more interested in a personal war over achieving the corporation's goals. Meanwhile, the little kid has managed to sneak into OCP and hack their systems, putting out a subversive broadcast, which instantly plunges the company into catastrophic financial strife. Our stock has dropped to nothing. We're ruined. That's all it took. We probably should have done this ages ago. McDaggett relies on these Kanemitsu androids to clean things up. But the trouble is these things are just as hackable as anything at OCP. And they're set to detonate should they be defeated. Not straight away mind you. That would be silly. With enough time for everyone to get away. McDaggett will even warn you about it. Those androids are programmed with a thermal failsafe device. Why isn't he running though? Oh, it's a nuke that he brought into OCP HQ in the middle of a city. But apparently they're the fools. Stupid fools. So ultimately, with the corporation literally in ruins, Delta City remains the pipe dream and money sinkhole it always was. A fitting end to a company that lost money on almost every single project we saw them undertake. But big questions still remain around whether Delta City would have even worked economically. Would it be a rich man's playground? Would there be space for the middle classes and other businesses? Or would this end up a sweatshop state enslaving everyone for the sake of export profit. Though I imagine with this corpse track record, it's more likely they'd end up selling to their own broke employees, shuffling their own money around. Surprisingly, in the end, the CEO does come up with OCP's most impressive sales pitch yet. A more generic corporate agenda that they'd actually have a chance of pulling off. Let's gentrify this neighborhood. Fill strip halls, fast food chains, lots of popular entertainment. What do you think? Pity it's too late. What'd he say? He said you're fired. I reckon this leaves Johnson as the supreme winner of the corporate game. Like everyone else, he might be out of a job now. But since the very beginning, he gave sound advice and never stuck his neck out far enough to get his head chopped off, taking his paycheck and promotion, while all those around him got killed, fired, or prosecuted. It's another evil organization where sinking into the woodwork and accomplishing nothing is the best survival strategy. But not everyone had the luxury of a avoiding OCP's dangerous activities. And their stupidity may not even have been confined to the boundaries of Detroit. You see, over the course of the three movies, we're shown a range of global incidents on the news, most of which are related to industries that OCP is involved in. This entire world seems to be a bit of a mess, and it's not a stretch to imagine the company had a hand in everything. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for a job in Delta City and use anything but an ID 209 to blast that like button.